Welcome back to our two-day international webinar celebrating 75 years of Indian foreign policy. We start with our third session themed New India Foreign Policy in the Present Decade. The session will be chaired by Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee, former Indian Permanent Representative to the United Nations. The eminent panelists are Ambassador Amar Sena, former Ambassador of India to Afghanistan, Ambassador Navdeep Suri, former High Commissioner to Australia and Ambassador to Egypt and UAE, and Dr. Rudra Chaudhary, Director, Carnegie India. I will hand over the session to you, Ambassador Mukherjee. Thank you. Uh, we have a rich panel today, and uh, I am uh, proposing to uh, introduce uh, the topic of our discussion uh, <laughs> with uh, three broad references uh, and then request uh, each of our distinguished panelists to to take on uh, their presentations. I uh, think that Ambassador Amar Sinha would be speaking on India's development cooperation record with a forward-looking perspective in the G20 framework now that we are uh, presiding over the G20 this year. Ambassador Navdeep Suri would be uh, looking at the theme of participation of different stakeholders beyond state enterprises in India's uh, sustainable development cooperation. And Dr. Rudra Chaudhary would uh, touch upon the role of technology in sustainable development, uh, taking the example of uh, India stack. So the three broad references I would uh, like to place before you uh, are first, uh, India and the concept of sustainable development. Uh, this goes back to 1964, uh, when uh, India, along with 77 uh, developing countries, created the Group of 77 or G77. And in 1967, at their meeting in Algiers, the G77 adopted the Charter of Algiers, which called for a new international economic order. The response to that came uh, from the developed world in 1972 at the UN uh, a conference in Stockholm on the human habitat, at which India made the point that poverty is the biggest polluter. So converging uh, environmental concerns with development uh, priorities became the, uh, the endeavor of uh, the international community. And this came uh, together, converged in 1987 in a report tabled uh, in the United Nations by the former Prime Minister of Norway, uh, Brundtland. And the Brundtland report uh, for the first time used the word sustainable development in international relations. This uh, set the stage for the holding of the 1992 UN summit in Rio de Janeiro, which is often known as the Earth Summit, and uh, a process that took 20 years to, to fill out and uh, give a mandate in 2012 for negotiating uh, agenda for sustainable development, uh, which happened in uh, a space of two and a half years in the United Nations uh, and culminated in September 2015 in the adoption of Agenda 2030 on sustainable development, which has 17 specific sustainable development goals. India has played a very proactive role in each of these stages, and uh, there's a lot of literature available which uh, fleshes it out. Uh, the second uh, broad uh, context is India's own uh, foreign policy initiatives uh, in the bilateral domain. And this too uh, goes back to 1964, when India initiated the Indian uh, Technical and Economic Cooperation Program, ITEC, and over the past uh, decades, ITEC has been the primary vehicle for India to share her development experience with uh, fellow developing countries. I was fortunate in 1992, when the Soviet Union uh, 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 dissolved itself, to uh, introduce uh, the ITEC program in Central Asia. And uh, in the last 30 years, we've seen the tremendous impact this uh, program has had on uh, sustainable development uh, activities uh, involving India in Central Asia. The third point is uh, going back 75 years ago uh, in 1948, when uh, India took the initiative uh, to inscribe the 
concept of gender equality into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I think that uh, our discussions uh, would have uh, would be richer to take cognizance of the uh, the the policy of in, involving uh, women in uh, the endeavors on sustainable development. We have seen in uh, actual case studies and experiences of our own of how uh, women have uh, significantly uh, uh, contributed and uh, and uh, deepened. Uh, the sustainability of developmental activities in all our societies and countries. And this, I think, needs to recall where it started from, because uh, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was first proposed, there was no uh, concept of gender equality until Hansa Mehta, uh, the Indian delegate, inserted this in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration. In my own experience, I have seen uh, another uh, approach of India's, which is now becoming uh, accepted and understood in sustainable development uh, activities multilaterally. And these are through two uh, uh, platforms that India has used. One is an uh, older one called the India Brazil South Africa Trust Fund. Uh, the IPSA Trust Fund is headquartered in New York and administered by the uh, ambassadors of the three countries uh, in New York. And uh, the difference uh, of the IPSA Trust Fund compared to the other uh, sources of uh, development assistance available to developing countries is one uh, fact, and that is that it is uh, demand-driven and it is non-conditional. Uh, so we don't have uh, uh, the, the experience of a large amount of development assistance actually going back to the countries donating that assistance through the form of consultancies and so on and so forth. These are owned by the countries, uh, uh, developing countries, and today more than 35 projects have actually uh, taken off the ground under the IPSA Trust Fund, uh, which shows how uh, attractive it has been. The second is more recent, the India-UN uh, UNDP uh, Partnership Fund, uh, uh, which is about five years old now, and that also seeks to bring in a development uh, perspective from the developing country perspective into uh, activities of sustainable development. And I think that that uh, is an important uh, framework to keep in mind when we look at uh, recent uh, events, such as the Voice of the Global South uh, Summit, which took place in New Delhi uh, earlier this, uh, this week. Uh, with these words, I would uh, now uh, give the floor to Ambassador Amar Sinha. Amar, uh, you have uh, 12 minutes uh, to develop uh, your presentation, and we look forward to hearing from you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you to, and thanks also to ICWA and DG uh, ICWA who's there for uh, inviting us for this uh, important conference. Uh, before I come to the main theme, which is development partnership and and, and the changing role. Uh, let me just say that, you know, one has observed India's foreign policy, of course, 35 years from within the government, and now really five years from outside. Uh, so when we look back at the last 10 years, there are some uh, changes which have to be commented upon before I come to the main uh, theme. One thing which is very discernible to me, at least, is that our national interest has been prioritized uh, in several ways. And I think the most telling example is the changing narrative, as well as the actions that we have taken on how we deal with terror or state sponsor of terror. Uh, it is clear that India is no longer going to meekly accept attacks on its sovereignty and integrity and territorial integrity, and all such attempts would be robustly challenged and pushed back. However, when I say this, it goes hand in hand with what Prime Minister has said, Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, which also prioritized our neighborhood and the extended neighborhood, and which directly connects to our development partnership policies. Uh, and the second point is, of course, this was a dichotomy that all of us in, in the service faced, where the foreign policy narrative of the, in India's territory and territorial integrity tend to collide with some of the legal and constitutional provisions, which were done away with, and I refer specifically to Article 370, which has perhaps brought in line what our narrative is with the legal structure 
And this, I feel, uh, would release diplomatic energy and capacities uh, to focus on things that we do best, and that is development partnership that we have done very, very well. The third thing in the last 10 years that I would add is developing an idiom uh, for, of India's own foreign policy and drawing deep from our own socio-cultural and philosophical uh, traditions. Uh, no, whether it is the theme of Vasudev Kutumbakam, which now has been translated and has become the theme of G20 itself, one earth, one family, one future. Uh, I think uh, that, or when you saw the EM's book, The India Way, which actually draws very heavily from Mahabharat. Uh, and so some of these cultural traditions we have started using, and that has uh, become very prominent in the last 10 years. Let me come to development partnership. See, it was obviously clear that as India grew, both the expectations from it and its capacities to help people who are similarly placed would increase. And that is clearly shown in the numbers. So over the last 10 years, our aid budget, aid and assistance budget, I would call it, has more than doubled from close to a billion dollar. It is now today at 2.3. Uh, the last figure that I have of 2021-22, it was also reported that in 2015-2016, we have become a net donor. Uh, donor, And of course, the, the bulk of our assistance went to in line with our own uh, priorities uh, to our neighborhood, neighboring countries. Uh, in addition, close to $30 billion have been provided as lines of credit, uh, which are basically concessional lines of credit. Uh, and I must say that in our entire portfolio of aid partnership, we have used just about every instrument, whether it is the ITEC focusing on capacity building, concessional loans, grants, project finance. Uh, and mind you, and what we have done is we, in all this, we have followed the principles of what we call the South-South cooperation, you know, which arises from both our colonial past or shared history and its solidarity. Uh, and so, and the other major change, which I saw, of course, working in the neighborhood, was the focus on what we did and how we spent our money from the highest level. In fact, it, I think it was the first time the Prime Minister of the country, as part of his overall monthly review program, he started also looking at major development projects that we're doing around the, uh, around the world. Uh, and a number of our projects uh, came up for review. And that was... Uh, not only it made us accountable, but I thought that the system became much more responsive because, you know, India's aid assistance was also always sort of founded by this charge that we are very sluggish, uh, slow to deliver. But th this one review mechanism actually started opening doors on it. I think it facilitated and made uh, MEA's life much easier because most of the approvals that were pending would happen even before the, uh, the project came up for review. So that was one major change. So the hands-on approach of the top leadership and focus on development partnership, I think is another uh, very discernible change that I would uh, uh, point out here. Um, see, while we have, of course, uh, but this is more political, of course, that we have steered away from the, ideolo the ideologically based alliances or blocks, and we have built, uh, on our own policy tradition of non-alignment and strategic autonomy, but we are also building issue-based coalitions. And that I, I see is very, very critical in terms of development partnership as we go around. And you mentioned the voice of Global South. And I think that is what exactly India is doing. India is, sees itself as a developing country, as really a laboratory for developmental experiments, which can hold be shared with others, which can be scaled. And as Prime Minister said, that we would like to represent the voice of the developing South in, in, in G20 at that bridge. The irony has been that most of the developing world has always had representation in all the forums there, but they were never heard. Hopefully this time around with this concerted move, and, and in fact, I'm in Bhopal uh, actually attending a T20 task force meeting uh, basically focusing on development partnership. So hopefully this time around, the narrative is changing and development partnership with our help and the help of other like-minded countries and the two other chairs of G20 which will follow us 
will be brought center stage in the, on the G20 agenda. Uh, and one of the key points made today was that G20 actually came up as a response to a global crisis. But we don't have to really wait for a crisis to happen because the developing world is facing a crisis of sorts in terms of the financing, the multiple crises caused by uh, COVID. So is it something that we can start acting pro proactively and, and, and bring this uh, really center stage uh, uh, of the G20 leadership political agenda? Other thing that is quite clear that we, India also emerged as the first responder, uh, both to natural calamities uh, around ourselves, but also to some man-made calamities. And, and I'm, what comes to my mind uh, really is Sri Lanka, where we see that we have become uh, the port of first call when it comes to uh, broken economies or unsustainable debt levels, and, and somebody has to come to support your neighborhood, that India is, uh, has, has been very sort of generously going and picking up the pieces. So these are some of the broad contours of the changes. But let me quickly give you an example of Afghanistan. You know, Afghanistan today, of course, nobody wants to talk about Afghanistan since Taliban took over. But what India did uh, for the last 30 years, and many have asked me that have, has our investment uh, gone down the drain or it got wasted? Well, my answer really is no. And this is where we have contributed to sustainability in Afghanistan because of the focus on IPEC and capacity building. I think uh, this dictum that uh, rather than giving them fish, teach them how to uh, catch a fish uh, is holding in good stead. And if you see to, even today, the Taliban regime, if you look at the technical level officials, directors, sub directors, most of them are India educated. So the capacities that we have built in Afghanistan through the ITEC training program and perhaps the largest scholarship program that we ran uh, for over uh, 15 years of 1,000 students a year, that talent and that capacity will not run away. Of course, a very large number of Afghans have left, but they were basically Afghans who were educated abroad in the West and they found shelter uh, once again there. But most of the India-educated Afghans uh, are still seeking it out and serving in the best possible manner. There too, uh, while of course our rhetoric on terror and terrorism has, is very clear and is well known, but I feel that we are approaching it with great amount of realism, that it is our neighborhood and we can't shy away from uh, our responsibilities in terms of the assistance that Afghanistan needs today, Afghan people need. Uh, and so we are really walking the talk that we are standing with the people of Afghanistan uh, so despite uh, the risks uh, and both uh, physical as well as the reputational risks of sending a team to Afghanistan, we have sent a technical team there to coordinate the humanitarian assistance that we have been sending. Uh, so these were the few things. And of course, it was very, very heartening to uh, hear our Prime Minister speak at this summit, uh, Voices of Global South, which he uh, hosted on 12th of uh, this month, uh, virtually, when he actually announced five different initiatives. Uh, first, of course, was setting up of a global uh, South Center, uh, which was basically what uh, many of us have been working uh, with uh, other partners uh, on setting up a global development center, which presents to the world an alternative paradigm of development, which is sustainable, which doesn't lead to unsustainable debt uh, burden, uh, which uh, draws on local capacities, which is not capital intensive, et cetera. Second, he has, of course, said that we would be also be setting up a center for global science and technology, uh, drawing on India's own strength in this area. The third one is a vaccine maitri, which again is something that he has been talking about, that we will be there as a first responder in terms of uh, pandemics, uh, in terms of medical assistance that we can provide. And, and this also, I feel that's drawn from uh, two deep philosophical roots going right back to Rig Veda, you know, Bahujan Hitaya, Bahujan Sukhaya, that ultimately it is, you have to work for, for the common good of, of the largest number of people. And this is a great shift from the market-oriented, profit-seeking approach uh, in health sector. Uh, and this will be a paradigm shift if actually India could uh, get away from this uh, questions of IPRs and royalties and actually provide uh, pandemics uh, cheaply and affordably uh, to the rest of the world whenever the next pandemic hits. Uh, 
on climate change, the other on issues of environment and climate change, rather than just being a naysayer, which was uh, we were known as, I think we have come to a stage where we are actually offering solutions, whether it was the International Solar Alliance uh, Initiative, uh, now our own commitments on um, net zero uh, carbon footprint uh, by uh, a certain timeline, or even our own energy transition, a very expensive energy transition, uh, focusing on renewables, hydrogen fuel, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all things that we are not only willing to do ourselves and experiment with, but we are also willing to share this experience with others. And of course, the lastly, I would just say that the great shift in this has happened. And I guess it's the realization of the complexity that we face and the, and the challenges that the world faces, that we have moved away from purely bilateral aid and assistance and looking increasingly at trilateral cooperations, bringing in more partners, creating a forum or a platform like the Global Development Center or the South, uh, uh, South Center, uh, what the Prime Minister mentioned, where we could actually learn from each other and share experiences. Uh, I would stop there, and of course, I'll take questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amar. Uh, very rich and, uh, and uh, thought-provoking presentation. Uh, Navdeep, may I turn to you and uh, let you have the floor? Um, thank you very much. Um, my compliments also to ICWA for uh, putting this uh, together in such a comprehensive manner. Um, I'll just add two separate points to what um, uh, Amar has said and uh, as for what you mentioned in your opening uh, remarks. Um, increasingly, everybody's talking about uh, the sustainable development goals and particularly how uh, the march towards these has been impacted first by the pandemic and now by the war in Ukraine. Uh, and and uh, when I look at India's uh, development partnership program, I think it stands out for what we have done consciously, subconsciously or unconsciously uh, to promote SDGs. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of work in education, in capacity building, in healthcare, in housing, in power. Uh, now uh, on the environment through the International Solar Alliance. But we don't talk about it, we don't measure it, uh, we don't try and quantify uh, the resources that we uh, put into it. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a real need to try and uh, we're, we're doing the right things, but we're not measuring them, right? So I, I think if we can put together a project <laughs> that really tries to count all of the uh, uh, projects and uh, resources that have been uh, allocated towards projects in various parts of the world specifically focused on uh, on the uh, promoting the sustainable development goal i think in forums like g20 we'll have something really important to contribute um, the second thing i wanted to make and this kind of stems from personal experience is that uh, some 15 years back when I was at the Africa desk and President uh, Abdul Kalam uh, at the African Parliament in Johannesburg made this dramatic announcement that we would set up a pan-African e-network uh, for a tele-education and a telemedicine uh, framework available uh, to all 53 or 54 countries in Africa and that we would fund it for the first five years. So I had to do a, a fair amount of heavy lifting in the early stages, along with uh, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, who was then in Addis. Uh, and we put together this framework. And, and uh, it was quite remarkable, the uh, initial successes we had achieved uh, in terms of connecting Black Lion Hospital in Addis Ababa with the, uh, uh, with the Ames uh, in uh, and Delhi, uh, so that people in Addis could get cardiac or neurological or other consultations at a time when bandwidth was very limited and internet really wasn't what it is today. Um, and yet we were constrained by the fact that we were working with TCIL uh, as the operating agency and it wasn't the most efficient of players as they go. So we had a great idea. It was getting some really good traction, but execution uh, was a handicap. And that kind of set me thinking that when I speak with colleagues in, um, in MEA, 
why are we constraining ourselves in carrying out these projects largely to public sector organizations? Um, is it because we are stuck with the L1 uh, and it's, it's easier to go with a, a, a PSU? And how do we uh, bring in a range of new actors into our development partnership programs? Uh, so at ORF, I did a fairly uh, detailed paper uh, and we said, let's look at two sectors, education and healthcare. And these are key sectors uh, for the Global South in terms of our existing and potential development cooperation. But who are the existing players? Yes, um, the Tel Pan African Network, uh, rebranded as E Vidya Bharti and E Arogya Bharti, are still there and uh, have gotten a, a new lease of life. But what about all the uh, other players that are available in that space? Uh, and the three, sec three categories that we looked at in particular, one was civil society, uh, one was social entrepreneurs, and the third was tech startups. Uh, and if I take just those two sectors, healthcare and uh, education, so in, in um, education, you've got a civil society player like Pratham, which is highly regarded for the work it has done in Botswana and in uh, a couple of other countries. In healthcare, you've got somebody like Aravind, who again have a model which has been replicated through private enterprise in Ethiopia and in Nigeria and in some other places of how to develop, how they've developed these assembly line um, surgery techniques uh, to really dramatically bring down the cost of ophthalmic uh, uh, care. Um, so these are the two civil society uh, 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 players. Then you have a bunch of social entrepreneurs in this uh, space. And you've got some fantastic health tech companies, um, which uh, are really at the cutting edge of using software as a service and AI to uh, drive down the cost of healthcare. Uh, there's uh, UE Life Sciences for its early detection of breast cancer. Uh, there are others which are doing remote cardiology diagnostics and so on. Um, solutions that are as relevant for India as they are for, uh, for Africa. Um, in education, again, you know, you've got everybody from Simply Learn to Upgrad to others who are revolutionizing uh, how uh, content uh, can be delivered in places where you'll never be able to build enough classrooms and certainly you'll never be able to have enough teachers uh, or to be able to really meet the demands of the market. And so what I was trying to get at in this uh, in, in this particular uh, zone is that we our development dollar or rupee will get much more bang for the buck uh, if we leverage the capacities uh, that are available in the private sector uh, to work on some of the uh, areas that we agree with our uh, development partners I feel that by doing so, we are leveraging the passion, the creativity, the dynamism, and the domain knowledge of experts who have demonstrated the success of their models in India and may be keen to take these up in other countries. Um, they have a very outcome-driven approach, particularly some of the social entrepreneurs that we've spoken with. Uh, and they have a real grassroots understanding of key development challenges. Uh, which need to be overcome to get better results. Uh, and, and if you look at, again, the Pratham reports, so they are a case in point. Um, also, these organizations have access to other sources of capital. They are not reliant on government funds alone. Uh, th there are other channels that they can uh, leverage. So while your traditional model of using a state-owned enterprise is completely dependent on government funds here, uh, you know, you can probably add topping up resources or supplementary resources to uh, achieve, the, uh, achieve the same goals. And, and by introducing these organizations as agents of change uh, in other developing, uh, developing countries, uh, India would have the opportunity to nurture global champions and also uh, burnish uh, brand India uh, in terms of uh, the uh, way these companies would go about and uh, carry out their uh, projects. So I really feel that several of these tech startups, 
um, several of these social entrepreneurs have the potential to change the development paradigm through their impact on both access and affordable delivery of education and healthcare. Um, and and, and uh, perhaps we really need to try and look at how we integrate these uh, into our um, development partnership uh, programs. Um, so I just wanted to leave that thought because I think I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Amar, you would have more details on this, but I'm aware of only three cases where we've stepped out. There's the Jaipur Foot uh, project that we've used in a number of countries with very good effect. Uh, there is the Barefoot College with the Solar Mamas program that has been very successful and applauded. And then there was the famous case of Seva going uh, to Afghanistan and maybe a couple of other places for uh, financial empowerment of women. Um, each of the cases that we did something, we got great outcomes. So uh, what holds us back from um, scaling up and uh, building upon the successes that we've achieved? I think I'll stop at that. Thank you, Navdeep. That uh, has been a really fascinating uh, exposition, and uh, I've learned a lot uh, from what you've said. And uh, the question you've asked is probably the most important question coming out of this discussion that we are having. Uh, may I turn to Rudra uh, Chaudhary? Uh, Rudra is uh, spearheading uh, Carnegie India, but I know he's also got a, 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 a special place for uh, technology and development uh, issues. So, Rudra, uh, can I ask you to please uh, make your presentation? Sure, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you to ICWA and the DG for the kind invitation. What I'll try and do in the next um, eight to ten minutes is two things, and I think it perhaps you know my set of remarks segues quite nicely from Ambassador Suri's concluding uh, remarks on technology development and what more can be done. And I want to talk about essentially two things. One is um, what is increasingly known as global stack, and I'll unpack why that is important from a foreign policy perspective and why we've seen massive change when it comes to technology and development, especially in the last eight to 10 years. And the second, I do want to touch upon um, the issue of emerging technologies in the economy um, and what more foreign policy can, can, can do here. And I do think that we are in a very special place today where unless we're able to maximize the effects of the geopolitical disruptions that we see, and a lot of that will require internal maneuvering, um, we possibly, you know, we may just miss the bus on a whole range of issues. And essentially what I'm trying to say is I'm not articulating myself well, but I think we're well placed to make the best of these geopolitical transitions. So one global stack to emerging tech on global stack. Um, you know, Ambassador Sudi talked about the capabilities that we have in India. The last decade was about building domestic technological capabilities within India. And it all started with Aadhaar. So if you think about Aadhaar, and I just want to put a couple of statistics here that might be interesting. The first Aadhaar number was generated in September of 2010. In the last eight years, or in the last nine years, you've seen an increase of about 900 million. We're at about 1.34 billion Aadhaar cards today. And just to understand how this works and why do we call it India stack is Aadhaar is at the bottom of the stack. It is the building block of the stack. It is a set of protocols which essentially have allowed us and will continue to allow us to do all sorts of things with technology, financial inclusion, um, and essentially reaching the last million, not even the last billion. Um, UPI got off ground um, around 2016 and you know, I just want to again share some numbers with you. In July of 2016, there were 21 banks that were essentially integrated with UPI with roughly about 90,000 transactions per month. Today, you're at about close to 400 banks that are integrated with UPI, and you're at about 7.6 billion transactions that take place per month. That is an incredible feat. It is exactly why credit card companies and MasterCard and Visa are basically turning around and saying, okay, we got to get, we got to get in line with this, with real time payments. So what I'm trying to say is that what we've seen in the last six to eight years is not just a change. It's a massive transformation of not just the digital economy space. And I think people mistakenly talk about transformations in the digital, in the economy, as far as inclusion is concerned, 
as far as banking is concerned. I'm, I remember, you know, uh, Prime Minister Modi's first set of comments. I think it was, if I'm, it's, it was either Republic Day or Independence Day, 2014 or 2015. I'm, I, I can't quite uh, recollect now. Where it was the first time that he articulated the terms Digital India, right? And many people turned around and said, okay, but how are we going to do this? How are we going to actually make the best of what is called quote unquote Digital India, quote unquote Make in India, quote unquote Startup India today? Fast forward to 2022 and just look where we are. Think about the numbers that I've just talked about. Um, we have, so essentially we have a unique identity number, which is the bottom of the stack. That unique identity number has allowed us to build real time payments by which in almost any nook and corner of India today has a barcode basically as a sticker attached at the back of an auto somewhere, right? Your fruit sellers and vegetable sellers take a UPI payment today for 10 rupees, 20 rupees, 100 rupees, right? Um, on top of that, today we're in the process of building out what is increasingly, um, what is popular being called health stack, which is essentially a unified health interface. So that's, so, you know, what we're seeing is the building block of Aadhaar move to payments, move to health. And essentially all of this is about inclusion. It is also about market access. And I'll come to that. This decade is about, in my view, it is about global stack. It's not about India stack. What India stack could have delivered for us, it has delivered and it will continue to. Seven and a half billion transactions will become 10 billion transactions. It will become 15 billion transactions. My sense is we should not hypnotize ourselves with those numbers. Um, we should now start looking at the thing is, what do we do with our domestic architecture? And how can we leverage this for a foreign policy, for development and for the global south on the one side, but also for building markets in the global north? This is not just a development project. This is a project where you actually require the private sector to come in and find alliances by which um, you can reach different markets in rich capital nations as well. So two things in terms of where we are in terms of opportunity because of the massive changes that we've seen, especially in the last seven to eight years where the statistics are very clear, is one is taking UPI across borders. UPI is essentially a pipeline. It's a set of protocols. It's architecture, right? Um, the Ministry of External Affairs and, in fact, the current Foreign Secretary um, has done a staggering job of taking UPI to Nepal. Um, our current ambassador in Paris has taken UPI to France, where we have an agreement today with Lycra. He was the same person who took UPI to Singapore. But I think we're at a place where we need more than mavericks within the MEA to take our domestic architectures to different countries. It has to be institutionalized and systematized into the Ministry of External Affairs. And that will unbundle the transformations that we see across borders. Um, and keeping in mind that, you know, many other parts of the Global South have their own architectures. Kenya has a very impressive architecture in m -Pesa. Brazil has a very impressive architecture in PICS. So the key question for us, I think, in this decade is if we're really to transform foreign policy and take an Indian architecture abroad, which is, by the way, democratic, it's open, it's built on open APIs, it's built on open protocols. This is essentially our, our democratic value proposition to the world through protocols and pipelines and technology. We have to, number one, I think, do quite a bit to internally rewire ourselves to be able to understand the technology and take it across borders. The Ministry of External Affairs has the new division, relatively new, new and emerging science and technology. But if I can speak frankly, in, even if it's an open forum, we have to do 10x of what Nest is doing today. Um, primarily because we have to capture this moment, and the moment is now. Um, you know, there's no mistake that DPIs have been baked into our G2, G20 agenda, and for excellent reason. Because essentially what we've done in India, unlike many other parts of the world, is the government of India that's built the stack. It's not some private sector actor in Kenya or in Brazil. And it is on top of this government of India built stack that we're asking the private sector to come in. When you do a, group, uh, a GPay transaction, GPay is just a layer of technology that has been pasted on a stack built by government of India. So let's use that opportunity. Let's think strategically um, and let's introduce this into the lexicon of international relationships and partnerships going ahead. Very quickly on the last point is as much as we perhaps focus on global stack, you know, we're at an incredible point today when it comes to emerging technologies, whether it's quantum, civilian space cooperation, 
building a semi semiconductor ecosystem in India on biotechnologies, biosafety, security, the list goes on, AI, ML. So the key question is, what do we do? Um, one, and, and here I think I've did, there's, a, there's a, the change that we've seen in the last three to four years across government of India, Ministry of External Affairs, the National Security Council, the mighty uh, telecom ministry and others, a level of coordination to basically say is that, look, we need to all work together in order to be able to attract these investments, these technologies, and work through traditional issues and problems like export controls, ITAR, et cetera. And I think what's impressive is in the last three, four years today, we have national missions that are designed and coordinated in a way in which different parts of government are speaking to each other. We have an India Semicon mission, we have a quantum mission, we have something like an AI mission. Um, and a lot of, lot of these conversations around emerging tech have now been formatted into bilateral negotiations. Um, you know, the NSA will be out in the United States in two weeks from now, talking to his counterpart about a new initiative in critical and emerging technologies with the United States. That is about space. It is about quantum. Um, so I think, you know, and so if you're talking about new India, I think new India is built, a part of new India is built on technology that can have benefits for us when it comes to economy. And the last four or five years have shown how these changes have massive benefits domestically. We're at an inflection point to take what we have domestically, build it across borders, leverage foreign policy, but perhaps not be too strategic. Perhaps, you know, be less strategic about the global south than we sometimes are. It is our technology. Yes, it is our IP. We're proud of it. But sometimes it's okay to open those protocols up to countries which we like. And by nature of that, there'll be countries who will take the protocols that we don't necessarily like. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, illuminating, uh, slightly provocative uh, presentation. Thank you very much for it. Uh, I would now rely on uh, Dr. Dhruva Jyoti to let us know of the comments or the questions that have been raised in the chat so far. Uh, Dhrubo, are there any people who are? There aren't any uh, questions, sir. Uh, so there aren't any questions. Then uh, my next uh, sort of step is to ask our panelists themselves uh, if you would like to ask uh, uh, you know questions of each other's presentations. But uh, starting the ball rolling, if I may, as uh, the the privilege of the chair, ask uh, Rudra uh, one question, uh, and that is. Uh, uh, the impressive list of uh, capabilities, technologies that we uh, spoke of uh, through uh, in your presentation. Uh, is there a receptive uh, global space for us to take those out or would we face pushback uh, from people who may not be either on the same page or who may have their own interests which they feel are threatened by what India is uh, wanting to offer? I think the answer to that question is both yes and no, sir, which is what it, what makes it quite delicate. Um, just three quick points. I think when we're talking about taking our architectures to different parts of the world, we have to divide that up into two, two sections. So one is parts of the world which require architectures and don't have the sovereign capability to build it themselves, right? Or at least at this particular point in time. So if I take the example of UPI Nepal, or if I take the example of UPI and, uh, and Bhutan, for instance, those countries fit within that paradigm where we're going to have to build the pipeline. We're going to have to transfer the protocol and we're going to have to be benevolent enough to be able to say is that Nepal will now call it the Nepal Payments Corporation and Bhutan will call it the Bhutan's Payments Corporation. They will basically use it for their own benefit and good, right? Um, but the second is where I think we can take a lot of our learnings um, in terms of building capabilities um, and engage with countries from across the world that have invested a great deal in their own architectures, Rwanda, Kenya, Brazil, um, and even the United States, which is now building their own payment system called FedNow. And there, I think the argument is going to be, have to be about principles, cybersecurity, norms, uh, open architectures versus closed architectures. And my sense is these are exactly the kind of things that the G20 coordination group is looking into to basically bake into our declaration in September. But yes, I mean, I, I would be honest is 
and I'll kind of be completely blunt, is there's an advantage in advocating our digital capabilities. But I think we got to do that with delicacy and also appreciate the fact that we're not the only ones who are in this game. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, turn, yeah. I, just, just, yeah, please. Yeah, just, just wanted to add uh, to um, Rudra's point. You know, I think four or five years back during our annual Heads of Vision conference, um, Sanjay Anandaram from uh, India Stack actually came and made a presentation uh, to all the um, HOMs uh, about the India Stack and the kind of the point that Rudras made about its potential to uh, go global and what uh, Heads of Mission could do. Uh, so it's something that uh, uh, certainly institutionally has been part of the MEN uh, network. Uh, Amar would perhaps have more uh, data on this, but I thought that about 28 or 30 countries were already at various stages of conversation with India about uh, uh, getting some piece of India stack into their uh, in, into their system. I, I, I don't know what the latest uh, on that is. And, and finally, uh, just to uh, add to Rudra's pleasure, uh, you know, when the Prime Minister uh, came to um, Abu Dhabi in uh, September of uh, August of 2019, and launched the UPI and Rupee uh, in in in, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, and actually uh, swiped the Rupee card to do a transaction. One of the things that we were trying to do was we brought together twenty of the largest corporates from uh, healthcare, from retail, from other sectors, to sign off to say that they and and they would they would carry a sticker or a placard saying we proudly accept Rupee. Uh, so, so, you know, just to get more buy-in into it at, at, a, uh, at a mass level. Amar, would you like to uh, add or, or comment on anything? That... Just to add for uh, Navdeep, Navdeep raised this issue on uh, the data since 47. In fact, RS actually has created, just finished an uh, entire database of all assistance given by India, MEA, non-MEA, no, but it, it was, of course, it was done over four or five years, but they have now tabulated the data right from 47 till now uh, in different categories. Of course, what we have not done uh, is tag each one of them in one of the SDG goals, because I'm sure they are all linked to one or the other. Uh, and that is an idea that we have even suggested to MEA that, you know, when we sanction a project, uh, we can actually give it a unique identifying number no linking it to the sdg goal because it it in the national reporting that we do it actually helps us because you can get the data with a click of a button uh, and it is fairly simple to do uh, so we have that if in case you wish to have some access someday uh, do come over uh, we'll be happy to show it to you we did a presentation for any also uh, it's staggering amount of data uh, there on on um, on upi uh, rudra You'll be happy to know at Arise, we also have this initiative called GDC, Global Development Center, which is basically trying to do exactly this, that the digital platforms that we have created, trying to market these, market these in a sense, popularize these, both COVID as well as UPI. And of course, we have found tremendous uh, response in among the Af African countries and, and, and PCI teams have been sent by GDC to at least four Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, uh, and I think uh, last week was uh, with Ethiopia, where the central banks and the monetary authorities, in, uh, along with our embassies, we have basically started doing a, a sort of online video conferencing first, and then followed up by either visits from them or by us. And obviously, their NPCI is working very closely and, and has gone to these places, and they're seriously looking at it. The question I had with you is that, you know, uh, while of course UPI is absolutely outstanding. But what has stopped from Rupee being uh, marketed globally as an alternative platform for uh, transfer? I have not understood. Few countries have taken it. I think uh, UAE has done it, uh, where you can transfer Rupee. But Rupee, uh, to our mind, for the last five, seven years, especially when I was in Afghanistan, and where 100,000 Afghans used to come for medical payment, and they really used to carry a, a bundle of currency notes. And we had actually worked out a solution with local banks where they would open 
a bank account for that individual, uh, mm -hmm. deposit the equivalent dollar with SBI or whatever escrow account our banks said, and issue a rupee card, which he can then use here. Which will, of course, debit to on SBI or whichever is the correspondence bank. Why can't a mechanism like this for our these are neighbors or those countries which send us large amounts of medical uh, tourists uh, be operationalized at a faster pace? Because it, it, they face a huge problem uh, bringing uh, cash or getting Indian currency and then paying off the medical bills. Would you have some idea? So I'll just make two points. On your first point about UPI and taking it across borders. I think the MEA has done a you know fantastic job working alongside NPCI, um, and I think there are individuals, as in any organization and institution, who've kind of really kind of taken it upon themselves to say, is, okay, I'm going to make that MOU happen. Just you know, I think the point I'm trying to make is that we've done very well, but I think if you have to take the Prime Minister's vision to its logical conclusion, we'll have to make bureaucratic innovations that we are not comfortable with. I'll be honest, sir. You need a diplomat sitting inside NPCI in Mumbai. The Indian Semiconductor Mission should have a diplomat attached to the ISM in Seoul, in Tokyo, in Washington, D.C., um, in Taipei. The Indian Quantum Mission should have a diplomat attached to it in Singapore, parts of North America, and Europe. That is the only way in which we're going to be able to maneuver this system. And I think it's more a bureaucratic politics point. But I think those are the kind of innovations we will now need to kind of jumpstart this process at a different level altogether. On the second point, I completely agree, sir. Rupee is a fantastic product. It's an open forum, so I'll be a little careful. But I think a lot of it has to do with kind of, you know, to put it, I can't think of any other way of putting it, is muscle in the banking and international settlement field. And there, there are at least three organizations, corporations, that have had decade-long experiences in the way in which they're able to shape the system, maneuver the system. And I think that is exactly why we in India, A, need to appreciate that just a product alone is not going to give you the economic results we want. We should have, we need to be doing more in training for ICANN, for ITU. We should not, you know, we should be doing more with the Bank of International Settlements, notwithstanding who else from which other countries are equally involved in these processes because it is these standard setting bodies and it is these clearing houses essentially that become very important to take a particular product and not only evangelize it, but to actually just advocate it across borders. Thank you, Rudra. Uh, uh, there was a question in the chat about, uh, uh, I think it probably is addressed to you, Rudra, about uh, are you aware of uh, cyber security uh, regarding these, uh, the use of, I mean, of when we take India stack uh, components and offer them, if you use UPI, for example, uh, what is happening with the securing of the, the, the cyber domain, which uses, uh, which is used for these transactions? Are you aware of any of uh, these? I think perhaps Ambassador Sina or Ambassador Suri be better be able to ask this. Um, but what we haven't seen in India is one thing, I mean, I can only answer this question by deduction rather than knowledge, which is that what we haven't seen, we've seen breaches for sure. It's in the public domain. Um, there are cyber attacks happening every day. The AIMS attack was quite scary for many people, um, which looks at health records. Um, but what we haven't, I think, seen as yet is, at least in the public domain, is a massive breach of data um, from um, government-run protocols. So obviously something is working. I'm sure it could work better, but something is working um, for the scale that we have in India, which is unlike any other country, no other country, not even apart from another one, but that has a very different system of political governance to be able to make things happen. No democratic country has a scale that we do. Um, but I think cybersecurity is an area where we will need to do more. We will need to cooperate with others and we will need the technological know-how. Some of it will start with skilling. Some of it will start with, we will have to build incentives to make sure that we have IT experts who stay with parts of the government machinery rather than Microsoft or Intel. And going a step further, I think at times, you know, there will be a time where this state will have to get comfortable enough with different parts of the private sector working inside of government like you have in other dem democracies as well. Some of it already happens, but we'll have to, I think, be kind of, we'll have to enlarge that feed. Yeah, sure. 
Thank you for that. Uh, there was another question to you, in fact, uh, in the chat addressed on on uh, protection of uh, data, uh, you know, individual. How do you protect the individual when collecting data, uh, digital data? Uh, would you like to comment on that? So very briefly, we, there's a draft uh, personal data protection bill, which has been floated by the METI, which we at least as an organization think is extremely pragmatic. We think that this is the best iteration of the bill that we're going to get for economic reasons, for privacy reasons, and keeping our state capacity in mind. Once the bill becomes a law, hopefully in the budget session, we will have an architecture for protection as well as for clarifying what the economic use of data, how the economic use of data will be determined. Thank you. Uh, Amar, there is one question to you regarding what should be the framework of India's development cooperation in Afghanistan? Would you care to just comment on any anything? So, um, well, I think we are doing what we can do right now, given the circumstances, and basically, which is focused on humanitarian assistance, uh, uh, which is, of course, the catering to the immediate requirements of whether it's vaccines, medicine, uh, resupplying the Indra Gandhi uh, hospital for children, uh, wheat, uh, which was a huge food food shortages in Afghanistan. In addition. Uh, some of the I've heard at least from the Taliban leadership uh, that they want some of the old small developmental projects uh, restarted. Uh, plus, I think one of the larger projects, which was uh, actually on very close to starting before uh, this regime change took place, was a water supply barrage for um, I think it's the I forget the name. Uh, of that uh, project, but it was basically for supplying uh, drinking water to Kabul. Uh, so I don't know whether this can be done given the security situation. Uh, there is, while Taliban gives assurances, but I don't know how how much in control of the situation is Taliban itself, because there are now new actors uh, which are actually harassing Taliban itself, and there are daily attacks. Uh, attacks against diplomatic missions have happened, uh, and in fact, Russian consulate, two consular officers were killed. Then um, Chinese business interests were attacked. They, they were staying. The Pakistani uh, CDA was attacked. So, given these circumstances, I don't know how much, how much of a footprint or presence we can have. But whatever we can do, do remotely, uh, we should. Uh, for example, uh, what they have precipitated a crisis. The Taliban in terms of closing down the schools and colleges for women. Now. Would we like to get to that space? Because obviously it will irk the Taliban, but it will at least be Sharia compliant that they are staying at home and uh, remaining in the Parda, but still getting education. I don't think the Sharia has a restriction on, on women uh, getting any information and knowledge, even if at their home. So these are areas, and of course, a lot of the standard students, whether they can be uh, enabled to complete their online education, that will be a big help because uh, their education in India on scholarship got disrupted uh, because of this. So these are, we'll have to take baby steps uh, to my mind right now because the picture really is not clear. While Taliban is there in uh, sort of holding power, how long it will happen, when things would uh, explode and go out of control, it's difficult to predict right now. Thank you. So uh, before we come to the end, Navdeep, would you like to uh, make any comment? on? No, I think uh, Amar's Amar, Amar, Amar handled it. Uh, I'll just leave that uh, thought. Uh, what, what Amar said that they've quantified the development assistance. I think tagging it to SDGs uh, and 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 uh, also allocating some resources for us to talk about the wonderful work that is done as part of our development partnerships. I think is crucial. Uh, other countries start up front by sending setting ten percent for marketing. <laughs> <laughs> right or publicity. Uh, we, we we do a lot, but we don't talk about it. It's time that we started measuring, quantifying, and speaking about it. Thank you, uh, Rudra. Any last thoughts? Answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Director General of ICWA and all her colleagues, uh, and particularly Thruba Jyoti, who has uh, been uh, interacting with me regarding this panel for allowing us to have a, what I think has been a very rich discussion. Uh, it has thrown up a lot of ideas. 
and uh, while each one of those ideas has its own uh, traction and space, uh, there are some takeaways which I found uh, really fascinating. Amar, your 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 put your finger on the importance of a review mechanism, uh, which I think has been one of the biggest changes that have come about, and to ensure that uh, whatever we do is actually done and implemented, and 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 uh, there's accountability and transparency. Uh, and your idea of uh, moving to trilateral cooperation uh, away from the traditional bilateral framework. Uh, your your you have beautifully brought in the importance of having uh, uh, stakeholders beyond uh, state enterprises in our development uh, partnerships. And I think that that uh, and the way you have described it, the logic uh, speaks for itself. And I hope that uh, the proceedings of our discussions, if they reach the policymakers, uh, they will uh, sort of look at it uh, uh, in a positive way. Uh, Rudra, you have given such a lot of information, I would hesitate to even uh, take one out, but I am intrigued by your reference, uh, and that comes, I think, from belonging to the tribe to which uh, Amar and Navdeep and I belong, that you think that putting a diplomat in these missions will somehow uh, bring things together. I think that's a very big uh, um, sort of um, positive uh, assessment that you have as uh, someone who's from outside the foreign service in the ability of uh, Indian diplomats to catalyze uh, these missions that you spoke of. But I think that uh, in a way, uh, having worked in our multilateral missions, uh, I think I understand what you're saying, because uh, uh, as we were taught when we joined uh, diplomacy and, and the foreign service, that a lot of our work uh, as diplomats is uh, spent inside our system, doing diplomacy within our own system, as much as it is done in doing diplomacy with uh, other countries outside. And, uh, with these, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, it has been a really rich afternoon's discussion. And thank you for taking the time to uh, to be in the panel. Uh, may I turn it back to you, Dhruva Jyoti, now? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Mukherjee, for chairing the session. Uh, Ambassador Sinha, Ambassador Suri, and uh, Rudra Chaudhary for giving us such an enriching session. We will now take a break to 